uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce our colleague from Los Alamos National Laboratory, who was co-invited by Nuclear Engineering Department and Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. As you know, we have great collaboration with uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. We are sending our students uh, that are fellows of uh, NSSC every summer for eight weeks. Uh, to Los Alamos, many of our former students are employed by the lab and they need more young people. So it's exactly what you will hear about today. Um, just a few words about Mark Chadwick's background. Um, he obtained his PhD from Oxford um, and uh, came to this country. So he had a um, 30 plus year career at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And what we heard from him, he enjoys great life at Los Alamos, particularly uh, great outdoors and skiing, there is still snow um, there, we don't have snow, unfortunately. Uh, I also come from northern parts, I love snow. Um, he led the simulation code division, uh, which maintains, for example, in CMP code that many of you are using. Um, and also led uh, the DOE and NSA science uh, campaign program uh, for funds uh, to fund experiments at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, he also leads the multi-lab US collaboration effort on cross-section evaluations for ENDF um, database, which is very important. And again, our department is involved in that. Uh, he is uh, an ATS fellow and Los Alamos laboratory fellow. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, it's a pleasure to, to join you today. Um, I wanted to use this talk as a, as a way to talk about some of the nuclear science and engineering that we do at Los Alamos. Um, but I'll also tell you about what a, a great place it is to come and visit, maybe even have a career, uh, because we are looking to recruit the uh, next generation of scientists there. This is not jumping to life. Thank you. In general, at Los Alamos, we're a very, very broad lab, but our mission is to solve national, national security challenges through scientific excellence. Um, I'm going to focus today on some of the science in nuclear engineering. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the context of the work we do, the, the nuclear threats we face. Um, you know, for instance, you know, you obviously read the, read the papers, but just this morning in the New York Times, there was an interesting editorial by, um, by Ambassador Albright about uh, the concerns she sees in terms of nuclear security and the New START Treaty, and whether the New START Treaty will be extended. Uh, that's worth, worth reading. I'll talk a bit about the US nuclear stockpile and how we bring scientific capabilities to bear to, to certify our weapons. And uh, as I talk about stock, stockpile um, science, I'll focus on nuclear criticality and vision uh, in the last third of my talk. Um, well, you know where Berkeley is, and Los Alamos, for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit us yet, uh, we're in New Mexico. And I thought I'd say a few words about Los Alamos then and now. Uh, we have a long history uh, with Berkeley. It goes back to our first director, Oppenheimer, um, who was recruited from Berkeley. So the card in the top right shows the card that was given to him when he signed on as our first director. Um, you can see that he had been seen, married one year, which is a strange thing for fuels that you have to keep, keep track of. Um, here we have Oppenheimer, um, getting a, a commendation at the end of the war with President Sproul. Um, as I've been walking around the campus, I see Sproul Plaza and Sproul Hall. Um, I see Oppenheimer Way. So that's a great history that we're very proud of. Um, of course, this place itself was where plutonium was, uh, was discovered by people like Seaborg and Macmillan back in 1940. Um, Lawrence played an essential role in the history here. Uh, and then a little bit more recent times after that, uh, everything from uh, in the bottom right, uh, 
uh, Reagan, uh, I suppose by virtue of him being uh, the, the, uh, the governor of California sits on the regents of the, uh, of the UC. And so uh, we have pictures of Reagan here with the Los Alamos uh, director at the time, who was Norris Bradbury. And then jumping up there, we see also uh, JFK with, um, with Los Alamos and lead, Livermore leaders, including C. Bork again. Uh, this man here was Bradbury, who led the lab out to Oppenheimer. Uh, here is Johnny Foster, who led Livermore in the early days. So it's an exciting history we have. If I jump to mo the modern times, um, I just asked our lab to pull some metrics on collaborations with Berkeley. Uh, this shows papers that we collaborated on with um, employees and students and postdocs from Berkeley uh, in the last, um, well, actually going back more than two decades. But you can see all these different areas of research, um, very broad, uh, large numbers in astronomy and astrophysics, in biology, uh, nuclear physics, genetics, applied physics, etc. But I was kind of amazed how how breadth of some collaborations we do have. If I just look at postdocs that are coming to the lab, um, we actually, if I compare different campuses of postdocs uh, across the UC, Berkeley is our biggest uh, recruiting ground, so we have more postdocs from uh, from Berkeley. And again, they come in a, a, a large variety of different technical areas, um, many in engineering, uh, physics, chemistry, etc. but then lots of other areas as well. Now, um, you know, I, I myself, as you can probably tell by, accident, by my accent, so didn't start in this country. And you're probably thinking he came from Uganda, and you're correct. Um, so, um, my path here was actually growing up in Uganda, um, getting my education in England. Um, my wife and I came to Los Alamos 30 years ago. Um, it was a great and exciting place to do a postdoc, and I loved it. It was kind of nothing like anything I had seen before. Um, there were jobs that were very hard to get in the early 90s. Uh, the Cold War had ended, I was a foreign national. Um, so getting the next step was, was not easy. Um, I was fortunate that Livermore, just up the road from here, uh, had the good taste to offer me a position. And so I worked at Livermore and enjoyed myself very much for a few years. Um, then decided to go back to Los Alamos. Uh, if you're a nuclear physicist, Los Alamos is particularly attractive because there's so many, there's so many nuclear theories and experimenters there. We have the big lands facility, which is a little attractive for people like me who like doing we like doing nuclear science that overlaps with experiments as well. So I've always been working in modeling and simulation, but I love the kind of work that connects to experimentation. Um, then I came back to Los Alamos and I've been there for over 20 years. Um, and I, I'd say it's an exciting place to have a career. With a lab as big as Los Alamos, um, it's quite common to work your way around different departments. Um, I myself have moved uh, a number of times in my career. I very much enjoyed that. So, as I said at the beginning, part of my reason here is to encourage you to think about options such as uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Of course, I'm not the first Brit to move to Los Alamos. Back in the early days, um, we had a very important contingent of people who came to work on the Manhattan Project from Britain. They were called the British Mission. Um, actually, on the far left is, is uh, Henry. Uh, on the far right is Cockroft, but in the middle we have Piles and Frisch. Um, I was lucky to be able to meet and know Piles when I was a grad student in Oxford, and uh, he was still coming, and he's now dead, but he was a remarkable theoretical physicist. And of course, Frisch is tremendously important in our field with all the work he did with vision and detection. Um, in fact, during the early days, people used to say that you could tell who were the Brits, they were the ones speaking with the German accents. <laughs> because in fact, many people left Germany, uh, emigrated to Britain, quickly became naturalized as British citizens and then joined the war effort. Uh, so there's a long history of uh, a very international uh, atmosphere in the Um Our lab produces various movies about what we do at the Salamos, and they're usually too long. Um, and they, they often have lots of narration in them. Um, I thought uh, 
I thought it might be fun to try to have my own. Now, I did, we didn't film any new stuff for this. We just talked about the latest new things. It's only a minute long. Um, maybe you could indulge me on listen, listening to it. I don't know if you'll find it corny or whatever, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> So what you saw there was a lot of different facilities. I'm just going to say a few words about what, a little bit of what you saw. Um, Los Alamos does so many different things. And I'm going to focus here on nuclear and materials, because I think deep down that's our core capability at Los Alamos. Um, we are an accelerator lab. Uh, from the beginning of, of, of the lab, we've had many different accelerator capabilities. But our biggest uh, linear accelerator is called LAMPS. We accelerate protons to achieve E, to make neutrons. Those neutrons are used for nuclear science, material science, um, fundamental science. Uh, we also do imaging with protons. We do dynamic um, material movement by taking advanced pictures with protons. Uh, so that's one of our key facilities. Another facility that you saw in the movie was DART. This is a flash X-ray capability where we take images of um, surrogate nuclear weapons to make sure we understand the implosions. Uh, we have a long-term vision to have a future, uh, future capability of doing light source uh, experiments in material science that we call Damask. Um, we hope that that will reach fruition in, probably in more than a decade, uh, but that's the sort of long-term vision for the lab. We do a lot of work on plutonium, of course, we are a plutonium lab. Um, we do work in Nevada, where we uh, have integrated complicated nuclear experiments. Uh, they remain subcritical. I'll talk about those later in my talk. Uh, simulation is very important for us. Um, you will, as we heard at the beginning, you'll know the MCMP code. Uh, using MCMP uh, for a lot of different neutronics calculations for criticality, uh, for transport, for experimental design and interpretation. Um, that's important for us. Um, we have compact nuclear reactor ideas. Um, we're not really a, you know, a, um, a, a thermal reactor uh, commercial lab, that place is not uh, Idaho, uh, but we do have a, a, a niche capability in micro reactors, which could be fast or thermal. Um, one of them is called Krusty, that's being uh, exercised and developed in Nevada. Um, Actually, in the movie, you saw satellites. We actually had quite a big satellite mission at the lab where um, the sponsor is, pretty, is particularly interested in, in the ability to detect and interpret um, another country possibly doing a nuclear explosion. Um, but that drives a lot of interesting work with NASA as well and in detection physics. Um, we have astrophysics, we have fission, of course. Uh, nuclear forensics is something that your community knows about as well. Um, and this is an example of some of the basic science we do at LAMS where we, we can make neutrons uh, in, in um, quite large quantities, largest like a few tens of neutrons, uh, which are trapped 
at very, very cold temperatures where you can do fundamental science experiments. So this is just a taste of the breadth of nuclear and material um, things we work on. I thought it'd be interesting just to see some of the connection to newsletter, newsletter headlines in the last year or so, um, where we have everything from work on the HIV vaccines and biology. Um, I already talked about uh, compound reactors for, uh, for Trusty, uh, that's here. But we do work in space with um, the Mars mission, uh, Curiosity rover, developing some of the abilities to, to use lasers to um, measure uh, materials on Mars. Um, work on wildfires, earthquakes, I thought that would be appropriate for this audience. Um, and then the top kind of reflect to some of the topics I'll get to next in the talk about the nuclear threats we're facing. Um, at the very top, of course, uh, we've heard a lot in the last few years about um, the modernization programs in Russia and how the Russians um, have been very active in creating new weapons and new military characteristics, which is a real concern for us. Um, in the US, we have been not developing the new military capabilities, but we have been modernizing our stockpile. And that's also gone hand in hand with the Department of Defense, uh, modernizing the delivery capabilities uh, for the stockpile, in particular, uh, the, the missiles and submarines. Um, this this uh, new um, Columbia-class submarine <coughs> is in the process of being uh, built and will replace the Ohio class submarine, which, which contained the um, submarine launch ballistic missiles. Uh, I'm partly mentioning that because there's a tremendous amount of money going into that. Uh, you know, we, a lot of money goes into our nuclear capabilities in the country, but it's nothing compared to the actual delivery vehicles that, we, that, the, that the military is modernizing. A few years ago, the uh, the U.S. updated its uh, its nuclear posture and nuclear posture review. The last was in 2018, and that uh, that that document reflected the increased threats that we're facing and gave some recommendations to power forward. Um, it talked about how the United States now faces a more diverse and advanced nuclear threat environment than before. Um, there were a number of things that are worth reading in there, but it also points to the um, some of the Russian seemingly changes in doctrine about uh, their nuclear posture, um, concepts like nuclear escalation, where it appears that Russia at least talks openly about their willingness to use uh, limited nuclear exchanges to, uh, to advance their goals. Um, this has been something that uh, the US has been trying to respond to. And the posture review laid out their objectives. Uh, so the country's been moving towards um, this different, really different trajectory, uh, and it's and it's um, it's unfortunate in many in many regards. It's, uh, it's a, a worrying threat environment that we live in. The um, there's an interesting interesting statement from uh, John Hyten, who's uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, I thought I'll let you read that uh, that statement. It's uh, it's an interesting perspective of the kind of philosophy that we have to work with. Um, pre prior to this job, he was actually the commander of Stratcom. Um, the strategic uh, command is the organisation that uh, is empowered to actually um, lead the nuclear parents and actually get capable of fighting nuclear war. So it's grim stuff. Um, but he. Uh, uh, he understands that we have to be able to um, project our capabilities um, to maintain the peace. So now I'll just talk a little, uh, a little bit about the nuclear, um, the nuclear stockpile that we're stewarding. Um, this picture actually, the blue shows um, the, uh, the number of warheads the US uh, has had over time. And of course, we had these extraordinarily large numbers in the 19, uh, late 50s and 60s. Um, we're now down to a much smaller number, but still a substantial number. Um, the red curve shows the average age of those weapons. And so when the Cold War ended here, 
uh, we weren't uh, modernizing our stockpile at all, and so the age just went up linearly with time. Um, now we are rebuilding that stockpile uh, and bringing the age back, uh, back down again. Uh, of course, our goal at Los Alamos is to, uh, to assure that those weapons remain effective, safe, and secure. The Salmos is the design laboratory for uh, really three types of nuclear weapons in the triad. Uh, the first is the submarine warheads, obviously submarine launched ballistic missiles or tridents. Um, there's two of those weapons that are in the nuclear deterrent, uh, the W76 and the W88. We're also responsible for the W78, which is on Minuteman III missiles uh, on ICBMs. Um, Livermore also has a, um, a nuclear weapon there called the W87. It's also on the Minuteman missiles. Now, in my title, I comment on MERV capable. Uh, MERV stands for multi multiple uh, re entry vehicle capability, independent re entry vehicle capability. What it means is that one missile can hold more than one warhead. Um, at the moment, the US only has one warhead per missile. Um, but it's important that if, uh, if there are reasons where the need where the US have to upload more, we have that capability. Um, and I only mention that because of a connection back to Madeleine Al Albright, who um, points out that the New Start Treaty um, needs to be extended. Um, otherwise, the, the countries, in particular Russia, has the ability to largely um, upload the number of weapons that they could threaten us with. And uh, this is one of the options we would have to respond, but it's not, it's not one that we want to. And then the other is the NATO tactical deterrent. Um, we're responsible for the B-61 bomb that uh, is the heart of the NATO tactical deterrent. So, so I've talked about these different, um, these different weapons here. Um, this one, uh, this one called the W76-2 is actually a weapon that was called for in the nuclear posture review. Um, the nuclear posture review pointed out that Russia was developing a lot of lower yield weapons that they were um, potentially threatening to use in regional conflicts uh, in an escalation kind of uh, scenario. Um, the military decided that they wanted the US to have a quick response low yield weapon as well. And so Los Alamos uh, was asked to develop such a weapon. And uh, we have done so already in the last, in the last week, you may have seen some announcements by the Department of Defense that they've announced that we have now completed that weapon. So it, it's really part of the messaging we have in the kind of uh, nuclear deterrence world with Russia, where we communicate that we have solutions uh, to, um, to bring to bear. We at the lab have gone through a process of modernizing these weapons, which really means rebuilding them as we age. As weapons age, in fact, when I first started in, um, in the sort of classified world of weapons, I came in thinking that everything was physics. And it, you, know, you come in as a physicist, uh, weapons are remarkably fascinating, multi-physics phenomena, uh, very high temperatures, high pressures, material physics, nuclear physics. Um, over time, we start to realize that now it's all really engineering. Engineering has big challenges. But then over time, you actually realize, no, it's all chemistry. In fact, <laughs> aging of weapons really is all about chemistry. Um, weapons corrode, uh, materials become brittle over time. Um, and so we have to work all those kind of issues. And that's what we are modernizing as we do this work. Uh, the B61 um, has <coughs> comes in many different variants. Um, they're being uh, consolidated into a, a weapon that we're calling the B61 L, which will be the future of the nuclear deterrent. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, our, our responsibility at Los Alamos is really in the weapons design on the physics and engineering side and the surveillance side as we surveil the stockpile to make sure we understand the aging issues that are occurring. We also have a production mission at the lab. Uh, we make plutonium pits. So these are plutonium components for the implosion in the primary. Uh, 
we also make detonators and design detonators, and we also make power sources, uh, which is the 238-ton, uh, which is, for instance, used by NASA in spacecraft. Um, and I, even though my life is nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence, I don't want to give the sense that I kind of revel in that. It really is a solemn responsibility. Um, these are dreadful weapons. Uh, we hope they'll never be used. Um, but our, our responsibility is that we, we believe that we need to be part of them, making sure that we understand um, the, the fact that these things will work and that we have good minds to put behind that um, to support our deterrence policy. But I'll talk a little bit about how we certify the stockpile. Uh, in the days of testing through 1992, we did the tests and we had um, over a thousand um, experiments that are tremendous resources for us to this day. They are data that we are so proud of and, and that guide us in everything we do today and still. Um, they started with the Trinity test back in 1945. Um, we produced nuclear fusion in the lab for the first time uh, in the Greenhouse George experiment in 1951. That's almost true. Fusion was really produced on Earth first in accelerators in Cambridge a few years earlier than that. But this was the first time that it was produced in, in kind of hot plasma environments. Um, we, pr we produced the first full scale thermonuclear test at Mike back in 1952. But that was more like a lab, it wasn't really a deliverable bomb. Um, we had a tremendously important campaign of experiments. 50s in 1954 called Operation Castle, where we developed the first practical, deliverable thermonuclear devices, actually one year behind Russia. Russia was the first to actually feel a deliverable thermonuclear weapon. Um, I've left out a lot of history between those days and the last test in 1992 called Divider. Uh, but in that era, it was really all about developing weapons that were um, smaller and safer. That was sort of uh, the big themes. And by safe, I mean they would never go off uh, in an unfamiliar way, which would be disastrous. Um, today, we use um, all the physics we know, and I should say engineering and chemistry as well. Uh, we have very remarkable uh, simulation codes, uh, lots of lab experiments, and here's a, you know, a famous plot of how our PET scale of computing uh, is now being reached um, a log scale of watts per second in our computers against uh, data from the early days to today. And you can see this exponential rise in computing ability, which is really remarkable. So I talked a bit about the different types of capabilities from, from experiments and simulation through small scale experiments and integrated experiments we do today to give us the information that goes into these kinds of data go into our simulation codes and small scale experiments. These more integrated experiments, for the most part, are used to, to guide and calibrate and validate our integrated codes. And I'm going to talk the rest of the talk on one aspect of that, which is nuclear data and criticality. Um, this is a beautiful picture of a fission in a plutonium 240 nucleus after we had it. Had hit it. And we, this, this is important criticality for, of course, weapons issues, but also reactors, criticality safety, and so on. So let me give you an example of how we, um, how we kind of motivate our work. And we try to use a lot of uncertainty assessment to guide us as to where the, the important problems to tackle are. Um, what I'm showing here is the, uns the uncertainties in the assessments of some of the fundamental nuclear data, fundamental cross-sections. It happens to be for 1.5 million neutrons hitting plutonium. Uh, that's actually an important energy for us. It's the kind of typical average energy in a, in a fast chain reaction. So if you want to do, get a sense of, of where things really matter, this is a good energy to focus on. And these are different databases from around the world. This happens to be a recent focus. <coughs> and, uh, we've had an international collaboration between many different labs actually illuminates the fact that nuclear science is unclassified, which is great. So we can actually work with the rest of the world on these problems, even though um, we have to supply them to 
is going to have its own problems. And so this, this project was actually done through the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is an organization in Paris that's uh, got many countries that are part of the EC, including America, Europe, Japan. And these are different quantities that we have to worry about when a neutron hits the plutonium. It might fission, and our assessment of the uncertainty on that cross section is uh, 1.3% uncertainty. It might undergo fission and make a multiplicity of neutrons where we have mu bar to the EP, the neutrons get emitted. Um, and we're tracking here the uncertainty, only 0.4% in mu bar. And likewise, the, the prompt fission neutron spectrum, elastic scattering, inelastic scattering, radiative capture. But from these uncertainties, we can then propagate them to our simulation areas and ask, well, what's that mean for criticality? And that's what we get here. Uh, you can see different numbers. It's actually a strange Italian unit called a uh, percentile unit. Uh, we, the 1000 PCM is 1% in K effective, where K effective is, is the effective neutron multiplication factor. So K effective is, is at critical, it means K is one. Um, when you look at that list of contributing numbers, you can see that uh, you can see where some of the big numbers are, and that guides some of our research. And you can see that the total adds up to over one percent. Now, one percent might sound small, but in fact, in reactor physics, it's ter terribly high. Um, you could, if you didn't actually have integral experiments, you could really have a hard time designing a reactor. Uh, but we do have integral experiments. This happens to be a an experiment at Los Alamos called Jezebel, which is a sphere of plutonium, about 17 kilograms, which is critical um, when it's brought together. So these three pieces get brought together to make it critical, and we can measure that very precisely. And that actually helps us constrain our understanding of criticality very, 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 very well. But it turns out that we can match it very well, but we'll likely match it for the wrong reason. We have such big uncertainties here that uh, we can calibrate the right answer. Calibration is great, but once you go away from the calibration point, you're into extrapolation space. And so now I'm gonna just show a few examples of the work we're doing at Los Alamos to better un determine the underlying science. Um, the first one is, is a collaboration on the, on the, the, um, the prompt fission neutron spectrum, PFNS. So this is the neutron spectrum created by, the, by fission. And it's those neutrons that sustain the chain reaction. Um, if you look at that spectrum, it has a peak at about uh, one, two MeV, the average energy is about two MeV. And uh, we, we have gaps in our knowledge of this. You can see here and here, there's a much bigger spread in the existing database. Uh, we wanted to re reduce our errors. This is an example of how um, to pull this off, you really have to develop new detectors uh, a multi-lab collaboration, this, this really Los Alamos Livermore, the CEA, uh, many universities and grad students as part of that. And over, the, over really a decadal process, uh, we have now measured new data for that reaction. Um, here, I'm showing those data in red points. The spectrum itself um, is a you know, multi-dimensional quantity, instant energy, outgoing energy. So I'm really just here showing you the average energy. I told you it's about two MeV, and it is. It has a, as you go up in energy, it has this sort of short saw tape to shape, which reflects some of the fundamental physics of fission going on. Um, the new data have been very useful. Uh, they kind of showed that our previous database at Red and Ender wasn't so far off, but was getting too high here. Um, interestingly, it was way off at 14 MeV. And when I asked my colleagues who developed the NDIS database, how could we screw up so badly at 14, the answer was, well, it's never been measured before. Uh, so this was all based, whoops, this was all based on, uh, on theory predictions without the benefit of external care. And so um, it shows why these kind of experiments are important. Now, it's also interesting because some of these experiments we're doing today at high precision are uh, kind of hard to do. You know, Nuclear physics is a fairly mature field. Uh, the easy stuff was done a long time ago. So now to beat down the uncertainty is really requires thinking innovatively about new detector capabilities. 
We've also measured uranium-235 in this same collaboration. Um, there you can see we did a lot better. The truth is we actually had these data and we were developing this evaluation. So this helped us to get the right answer. Um, one important implication actually is that you can see with the new, the new evaluation is coming down softer at the lowest energies. Um, it's a little bit softer than the previous evaluations. Uh, that might sound like a small effect, but it's actually very important for the thermal reactors. And so we work very closely with the reactor community to make sure these databases work in their applications ahead of time. Um, you know, we have, in this community, as we are developing new capabilities, um, I remind everybody, it's like medicine, you know, to do no harm, to start off with. We can't put out a, a capability that might have been informed by one experiment, um, but not appreciate that it's gonna mess up the whole of the thermal reactor world in their simulations. Uh, you know, it, there's, a, there's a level of trust that we have to maintain with that community. <clears throat> Another experiment on Los Alamos, but actually led by Livermore, is one uh, to measure the fission cross-section itself. Uh, this, this shows the fission cross-section of the plutonium, actually in, in ratio to 235. Um, uranium is, is a, 235 is the standard. And so measure, many measurements are done like this. Uh, the energies here go from zero up to 20 MeV. And in this region here, you can see that the existing data <coughs> has, has an uncertainty spread of quite a few percent. This project has a goal to get down below 1%. Uh, the team's been working on this for, again, a decade. We're hoping to see data published soon on this. But to, to do these very high accuracy measurements really <coughs> is a, a challenging, uh, long process. I want to show a little bit about how we've dated the units in our simulation codes. So every seven or eight years, we issue a new national database called NDEF, which inc incorporates the best of everything we know. Um, it incorporates um, <coughs> these reactions and all these nuclei, in fact, hundreds of nuclei, but I pulled out some of the important ones that we've upgraded. Um, charged particle reactions, thermal scattering, important, you know, this is a collaboration with Navy reactor labs, nuclear resonance work. This is an area where Los Alamos is not an expert. We rely on Oak Ridge and colleagues in France at Cadillac. Um, work with Livermore on some computational advances for the formats, um, a lot of integral validation testing. So to pull this together, it's a, a kind of exciting big collaboration. Um, we, we write these big papers that, that are kind of refereed um, scholarly documentation on everything we've done. But part of the validation basis is to calculate um, thousands of critical energies and show that we agree pretty well with the data. So I showed you Jezebel, which is one. Of those thousands, this is one suite that we look at, which has 119 assemblies. Um, they're ones that we have a fairly high confidence in, unbiased, but most of those are measured. And we, we understand their uncertainties very well. Um, what we're looking at here really is, is the, the cumulative uh, chi-squared sort of uh, for this body of data. And you can see that for this suite of 119, when we included all, all of them, the last library improved the overall discrepancy by a factor of two. So it's these kinds of comparisons we have to keep track of to convince ourselves that we're incrementally doing a better job, not just in the fundamental data, but, but matching a, a wide variety of integral data sets. So far we've talked about stack of critical assemblies, which is very important for a validation of the reactor world. Of course at Los Alamos, we really care about dynamic. We love to, um, to try to understand and model uh, implosions. And uh, at Nevada, at the U1A facility, which is underground at Nevada, we're, um, we're allowed to do integrated um, scale experiments of nuclear weapons. Um, they must remain subcritical. So K is less than one. Um, if it was K is more than one, then it becomes supercritical. Uh, I think in the coronavirus world, this is, this is a equivalent to a, a large R naught value, uh, but this is when you get a chain reaction that's increasing um, quickly. So we do experiments that are subcritical, but we like to learn about 
um, what it might tell us about the performance of, of a pull-up meter, like the experiment we can't do. And so uh, we've been developing a new diagnostic, um, which we call NDSE, Neutron Diagnosed Subcritical Experiments. It's a diagnostic that we've been advancing in collaboration with Nevada. Uh, Livermore's now also joined in. And the idea is that during the implosion, we can take this and do an experiment for an instant um, in that implosion process, where at one instant, we flood the plutonium uh, compressed material with neutrons. And those neutrons um, initiate a chain reaction. Now, because it's subcritical, that chain reaction became in the way. The, the, the signature of that became the chain reaction. It was the gamma rays which were missing. They're actually fission gamma rays mostly. But we measure the fission gamma rays coming out. And by looking at the decay slope, um, for example, here, the decay slope here will tell us uh, the level of subcriticality. That slope uh, is often referred to as the number alpha. Whereas if it was if it was at critical, it'd be flat. If it was supercritical, it'd be growing. And so what we do is we have a we have a neutron source, which is a dense plasma focus machine that's been developed by our colleagues at Nevada. Um, that floods the 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 experiment, the plutonium that's inside this vessel um, with neutrons, and the gamma rays now come out down here. And we measure the gamma rays um, about 20 meters away. And uh, to date, we have been proving out this method on the surface in Nevada. Um, we have a mock-up of that facility where we've been doing a whole range of experiments that are getting more and more relevant uh, in their relevancy to a real nuclear weapon. Um, for example, here, this is at the um, above ground site where neutrons will come out, they'll hit this object. And this, is, this object now is static. Uh, it's a highly enriched uranium object. Uh, so it's kind of a surrogate. Um, it will then measure the gamma rays down here. The neutrons themselves are coming in a pulse. That's a, and it's not a delta function. The DPF produces a, um, a certain source shape that we measure. Um, but the, the way that the tail hangs up here is influenced by the criticality of that object. We actually infer the criticality by forward modeling with MCP. So we model in MCP the whole process of the neutrons coming, interacting with the object, all the decay down the line of sight to the detectors. And we, we optimize that agreement to infer decay. We can then see how well we do. We do blind experiments where we take a whole bunch of objects. Um, for example, here, they range between 0.9 and 0.95. And we know the value of that criticality uh, of those static objects. Uh, but we don't tell the experimentalists what that value is. Um, the experimentalists and simulation folk have to infer it from the analysis like this. And uh, if they got the perfect right answer, it would be up along a dashed line here. Uh, the extent to which they're off shows the extent to which we have uh, discrepancies in the analysis. But these kind, of, uh, these kind of approaches show that we can measure this criticality to better than 0.2%. And that's given us enough um, enthusiasm and confidence to now go to the next stage where we're now moving downhole in Nevada. Um, so this is, I wanted to give you a taste of that just to show you, show you the, the thrust that we're moving in at the lab. But to pull this off required an awful lot of work um, with experiments um, above ground. In fact, they started at LANS before they even went above ground. So a lot of work that goes between experiment and simulation. So I'm coming, coming to an end here. Um, this is our great first leader, Robert Oppenheimer, um, and wanted just to go back to the beginning with the UC connection. One of the reasons that the, um, the government decided to have the lab operated by the University of California from the earliest days was actually to keep it separate from the military. They wanted, they wanted to have an academic uh, and an independent intellectual background uh, because of the importance of uh, all these kind of issues about um, to be critical, to, um, to be always willing to share what evidence we have about a phenomena, whether it's good or bad. And that's at the heart of our history. Uh, I couldn't resist the 
um, the punchline about truth matters in this era of fake news. I'm guessing this audience is pretty much all behind Trump, and that's okay because uh, Trump would actually agree with that letter. That thing he also says the same kind of thing. Um, so uh, here are some other pictures about showing Los Alamos, uh, just to give you a sense of all the different kind of disciplines you can work on at Los Alamos. Um, we have a wonderful outdoor environment. It's, uh, it's a great place to have a career. Uh, so I look forward to some of you trying to you know, visit the lab at some time and into some of the some of the partnership programs we develop. Thank you. Before I open for questions and comments, I just want to ask um, uh, two names were mentioned of people coming uh, to join the Hampton Project from Great Britain. Uh, girls, if I'm pronouncing correctly, and Krish. What did they do <coughs> in Great Britain before coming to join Manhattan Project, and why were they invited? Anybody? Basically, they wrote famous uh, Krishper's memorandum in which they calculated and confirmed that super bomb could be made out of uranium-235, and they estimated critical mass, which was wrong, but they did estimate it, and they also estimated huge uh, destruction power of that. And tomorrow is February 11, 2020, uh, last year, it was 80 years of another great paper that Frisch was involved with Meitner. It was February 11th, 1939, that the paper only one page long appeared in Nature, in which theoretical explanation of fission process was given. It's all for me. I'm writing a paper, so I know all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, questions? Um, I just let students go first. But thank you for the brilliant uh, adult Livermore place. Sign me up. I'll come in across. I want to Really talk. Thank you for doing this. Um, question about the subcritical experiment. It raises many questions. Um, you understand the assembly well enough that in principle you could have gotten much closer to one. And this raises many questions. One is is there scientific proof to have tickled the dragon's tail a little bit more? B, what controls are in place that would prevent Kennedy from cheating? I mean, who would know if, if experiments were done greater than, slightly greater than K1 on a small assembly? Um, and, and so forth. So, it's, it's, so, and by the way, if something happened accidentally, how do you, did you report it? I guess it must be officially reported to the IEA and so forth. Yes, um, so this, this campaign of experiments that we're working in Nevada, uh, we have systematically um, been proving our ability to use these kind of experiments uh, where K is quite a lot lower than one. And we have, um, no, no surprise, but we made the case to the US government that the closer to one we can get, uh, the better everything becomes. Basically, there's less extrapolation. Uh, there's uh, signals to noise becomes a lot better. And so we've got agreement to, to go up closer to one. Um, the numbers I showed you on that graph were all static, and I can show those. I can't actually say uh, dynamic numbers here. Um, but in general, um, we are in a process of proving out that we can go higher and higher. And so it's, it's a kind of confidence thing. Uh, we actually did an experiment a few years ago where we, were, where we did demonstrate that we can go safely to quite a high number. Um, so we have some precedent in that. We'll get there again soon. Uh, you asked about whether you could go higher than one, uh, and anybody know about it? I would say in our country, um, things get out. <laughs> you know, even, we we would we won't go above one, and you know, if, if ever there was a mistake, it would get reported to the government. That's how things work. Um, regarding other countries, I'm not going to make any comments here. <laughs> okay, questions. Any 
So when you were showing the um, data on the mean oxygen neutron spectrum energies, you showed that for the case of plutonium 239, as the third chance fission threshold, you had a um, you did not have a dip, but for U235 you did. So what is it about the structure of the nuclei where um, you see that decrease in the mean energy for one but not the other? Um, yes, yeah, so the data here does show, show a dip, and here the data doesn't. Uh, I would say it's not an issue right now. Um, our models, you can sort of see from the model perspective why you tend to get the dip. So the models are predicting you do get a dip. Um, the teams have written papers recently on why that might be the case. There's actually a PhysRev letter pointing this out that could be, that could be published as a surprise. Um, somehow the process of fission is getting smeared in ways we wouldn't expect so that you don't see that sharp effect. Um, it could be related to the way um, what's called pre-equilibrium reactions happen uh, where a high energy neutron is emitted and uh, it leads you to a less of a very sharp phenomena. Um, but why that's the, tr the case for plutonium and uranium is not understood. Interestingly, um, our French colleagues have also done this experiment at Los Alamos but with, with different detectors that they brought with them. Um, I'm sorry, a different fission chamber they brought with them, the same detectors. Um, they see the same thing. And so we're trying to make sense of that now. But the, and then the, the overall difference here in this average energy, uh, that's big enough to actually get our attention. And so we're, we're working through the implication of what this means. So how many um, uh, I show some of these uncertainties in, in my talk partly because the team here is working on how to best understand uncertainties and how to treat them properly. Okay. Um, I think uh, I, I saw you kind of raising your hand. You... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about it. Uh, one more uh, kind of secret. Um, we might have Mark coming more often because he just told us that his son is in Berkeley in political science. So um, is he right. here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> good, good. So uh, we hope that uh, he will be visiting our department more often and engage. We do have some groups that uh, try to get people from political science. Um, uh, social sciences from other side of the campus to come and work with us. So with that, I would like to thank Mark once again.